this afternoon. Max with the chip. Brilliant oh, save by Nitreski. He really had to be on his toes then. Max almost nonchalantly chipped that ball around the wall, and Nitreski just managing. Hello Chelsea supporters, here at the Blue Day podcast, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest today. He made 175 appearances for the club, keeping 55 clean sheets. He was part of the Chelsea side that won promotion in 1984, plus he played alongside Kerry Dixon, John Bumstead and Pat Nevin. Here is Eddie Nedswicky. Eddie, welcome to the show. How are you? Very well, Keith. Thank you very much for asking me on. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight and uh, tell you my history, if you like, or tell you some stories. So here we go. Looking forward to hearing them. Absolutely. Eddie, to st- start off with, take us back to the early days of your footballing journey. Who or what influenced you to become a professional footballer? Um, well, I was. I used to mix between playing in goal and playing out as a young kid. And... Uh, Fortunately for me, one day on a Sunday, I was playing in an under-16s game and I was 12 um, and I was playing in goal. Uh, after this particular game, a gentleman came in the dressing room. Uh, he, he was an Arsenal scout and uh, he asked me to continue playing in goal. Uh, he said he would come back in 12 months' time to see me, see how I'd progress. But he liked what he saw. And, of course, I got very excited. You know, you're a 12-year-old kid and somebody's telling you that, you know, you've, you've got something there to work with. Um, and that's what happened. I, From that moment on, I continued to play in goal. Um, but, unfortunately for me, uh, the, the gentleman didn't come back. He actually came back two and a half years later. He was now working for Crystal Palace. But um, he had been ill. And uh, by this time, I'd... Uh, Fortunately, I um, had the opportunity to go to my local club, which was Wrexham, which was about 50-odd miles from where I lived. Um, and uh, it was actually John Neal came to my house and signed me as a 14-year-old schoolboy. So uh, that's how my career started, really, in terms of uh, you know the position I took in the game. And when you was that 12-year-old lad, who were your idols growing up as a kid? Well, my idols when I was a kid, I mean, I was a North Walian and uh, I'd better whisper, it, better whisper this, but I was a Liverpool fan as a kid. Uh, I used to, there were four or five of us who used to go on the train regularly from where I lived. And uh, yeah, it was just, you know, I, they were huge in my life right then. You know, I was a normal football fan who loved going to football matches. Uh, we used to go on the train. We used to make three connections, if you like, three changes and uh, get to Anfield at half past 11 after leaving on about nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, when I was a young boy of 10, I was very lucky to, uh, and it was only my third game there actually. And we were, Liverpool were playing Wolves this day. And it was, I remember the date, it was 31st of October. And um, we were walking around the ground, it was about half past 11. It was only our third game. Uh, and we've got the late, great Bill Shankly walking towards us. Uh, you can imagine we're 10 years of age, it's, you know, unbelievable. We're seeing this great man. And uh, we actually asked him for his autograph. And he went, aye, aye, boys, no problem. And then all of a sudden he says, hey, you're not from around here, are you? And we said, no, no, we're from Wales. He goes, hey, great players, hockey, Hennessy, Mike England, great, great players. Anyway, I have to go. Enjoy your days. See you later. And that was it. So, you know, it was uh, always remember meeting the great man. And um, that was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. And the next time I... Yeah, and the next time I actually met him, he was doing some consultancy work for Wrexham, and we were playing, we were playing Arsenal in the quarter final of the FA Cup in 1978, and um, it was quarter to three, and I'm in the toilet in the urinal. The next minute, he he comes and he stands next to me, and he says, 
hey, son, if you don't let any in, we won't lose. And I let three in and we lost three too. So there you go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, but, you know, um, great memories, great memories and what a minor. Oh, superb. What a story. But I want to fast forward to the summer of 83, if I can. Yeah. Yeah. You did sign for Chelsea from Wrexham. I believe yep. the fee was around £45,000. You mentioned John Neal earlier, but how did this move come about for you? Um, well, basically, John had moved to, the boss had moved to Chelsea um, the year before. And uh, Joey Jones, who obviously is a great friend of mine, um, had also moved in the October. And... Um, and then I knew of Chelsea's interest, and there were interests from other clubs as well. But obviously, once I knew that that uh, you know John Neal had come for me, then uh, you know obviously he'd done so much for me, and obviously signing me as a fourteen-year-old schoolboy as well, I had a great affinity with him. Uh, so, uh, and obviously my big mate was there, so it just seemed a, a great move. And uh, yeah, and here I was. I came to Chelsea in uh, I think it was the twenty-fourth of May, nineteen eighty-three. Um, and obviously then the story began. What was John Neal like as a coach? And sort of so describe to us sort of like any stories that you've got of him for those that may not know who, who he is or those that may only know him from sort of seeing like the Chelsea Museum and seeing sort of like the stories and the placards mm -hmm. of what John Neal did for Chelsea. He wasn't a man of many words, but when he did... But when he when he did speak, then obviously you know you you, you sat up and you took notes. Um, always one willing to give advice, and uh, you know I was all remember him as what he did for my career, and also he used to you know walking down the corridor and singing "Ei Adio, Ei Adio," you know, and away the lads, and and he was, you know, he was just great for my career. And when you know it's like everything else, if you're in any walk of life in any job, if if your boss shows confidence in you then that gives you great confidence and it makes you want to do well for them. And and he gave me that uh, footing in, in the professional game and I wanted to repay him with everything I had. And I just was so grateful for what he did for me. What was your first day of training like with your new team and what stories do you have of any sort of characters that you initially got on with the first couple of days of training? Uh, well, we went, of course, you know... <laughs> Even in my Wrexham days, I'd been to Aberystwyth for for all of the pre-seasons, if you like, during my uh, time at Wrexham. And then all of a sudden, I come to Chelsea and we're still going because John Neal liked Aberystwyth so much, I was going back to Aberystwyth. So, uh, uh, you know, which was always a grueling place to go in terms of the fitness regime. John always felt that uh, he could get two weeks work, one week's work, sorry, he would get two weeks work into one week there. It was that grueling. But he always felt that that's where our season and our base happened, you know, in terms of your fitness levels, your camaraderie amongst the group. And, of course, it was very important because we had, uh, there were six of us who actually joined uh, right. during, the, you know, during the end of that season. And uh, and it was important that we gelled very quickly. And uh, fortunately, we did. I mean, obviously, uh, Joe and Pat came from Scotland. Joe McLaughlin and Pat Nevin came from yeah. Scotland. Um, Nigel Spatman came from from Hampshire. Uh, Kerry came from, from the Luton area, but he signed from Reading, obviously. Speeds came, you know, and uh, J John Hollins, of course, came back in. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping I'm not forgetting anybody here. I better be careful. But I mean, it was just, you know, we just we just gelled straight away, and it was so important that we did that. And uh, we just grew as a team, and of course, uh, you know, we'd had a good pre season, as I've mentioned to you, how important Aberystwyth was. And, uh, and then that first game against Derby County, of course, you know, when uh, 17,000 people at the bridge. Uh, we won 5 0. I, I had nothing to do. I mean, you could have played in goal that day, Keith, to be fair. The lads were that well, good. Well, well. And, and <laughs> you know, and and uh, from there, we just uh, we, we went on a we, we went on a journey, and the snowball got bigger and it kept rolling and it got bigger and it got bigger. And uh, it was a great season. And by the end of that season, of course, you know, with the championship as well, we uh. We had over 40,000 in Stamford Bridge and it was like, wow. What did the Chelsea fans sort of react to you being theoretically the new number one goalkeeper? You know, what, what, what were their sort of reaction to you like at the time? Well, first of all, first of all, I always remember, you know, the first couple of training sessions and Steve Francis, of course, was there who, you know, I'd, uh, I'd played against and I'd uh, 
obviously Chelsea were on the television more than Wrexham were even in those days. So, uh, and I uh, and I knew what a quality goalkeeper he was, and I and I went in and I was thinking to myself, what do they need me here for? You've got this young lad who's got this wonderful pair of hands. Um, but fortunately for me, you know, I got the nod, and um, you know, I was be able my my performance levels were. I was unable to maintain and hopefully get better because of the, you know, Steve pushing me. And uh, I always remember that as, uh, you know, it can't have been easy for him, but he was, he was a great teammate and uh, we got on really well. But of course we had, we had the great late Peter Benetti coaching us and, uh, you know, what a man. Absolutely. You know, uh, you're asking me about heroes in the game. This was an iconic figure who was, you know, so, so willing to, to share his stories, his experiences Nothing was ever too much for him if he wanted his time individually, collectively. His sessions were always well thought out. And he had this great knack that um, he he would look at games. And like I just said to you, you know, you could have played in goal against Derby County. But he would always pick something out, you know, to try and help you. And he would call it, I'm being hypercritical. And that helped me no end. He was, he was just a wonderful, wonderful man. Um with also obviously being one of the greatest goalkeepers, if not the greatest goalkeeper in the history of Chelsea Football Club. So uh, it was just a pleasure for me to be working with such a such an iconic figure. And would you say his influence as a coach helped you when it was time for you to become a goalkeeping coach? So the methods that you sort of gained through the great Peter Benetti, you received and you was able to put that onto you for the next generation, so to speak? Well, well, absolutely, of course. I mean, listen, when I when I was growing up at Wrexham, um, I had a gentleman at first called Dave Gaskell who played for Man United in the 1963 Cup final. He actually made his debut for Manchester United in the Manchester derby. And he was he was in the crowd at Main Road. And the goalkeeper got injured and it came over the tannoy at my Main Road. Could the, Dave, David Gaskell come to the main reception at Main Road, please? And this is a young 16, 17-year-old boy. And he went there. So I had this this guy who, you know, at the time, I didn't know these stories, you know. Yeah. But I had this guy who was such a hard man, but a, but a wonderful man for me. And, you know, I've gone for him to all of a sudden. And now I'm working with Peter Benetti, this incredible uh, gentleman. So, of course, these guys had a massive influence on me. And, of course, because, you know, Peter had helped me develop, I had a great uh, influence on my my coaching career, if you like, if, uh, you know, I don't forget, I I didn't play for long enough. You know, that's one, obviously a great regret of mine and it still hurts to this day. But of course, because I've worked with Peter for, you know, the five years, then all of a sudden, bang, my career's gone. I thought I was going to play until I was 40. That was my plan, at least. Mm-hmm. I was always quite a fit guy. and But suddenly an accident happened and bang. Yeah, we'll you know, about I'm into that something later. else. Yeah. <laughs> But that's life, man. But there's always somebody worse off. So that is true. that is true. That, that's that's one that's one thing you should look into. Um, looking back on the, that promotion campaign, we did end up achieving promotion. The last game of that season, I believe, was away to Grimsby. The Chelsea fans, from stories that I can that I was told by supporters who were there, said it was an unbelievable atmosphere. Pretty much, Chelsea took over the town that day. <laughs> How big of an achievement was it for the club to finally get back to where they felt they belonged? Because, of course, we also beat Leeds 5-0 at Stamford Bridge, where you, you know, there was pictures that people can see online of you know three very influential people from Chelsea Football Club's history of Ken Bates, John Hollins and John Neal all in the stands with sun shining, knowing that they've achieved promotion. How big of an achievement was this for the club and for the players as well? Oh, it was huge. It was huge. I mean, you know, first of all, it was great for John Neal because of the fact that he'd showed confidence so many of us. He brought so many players in. And don't forget, he also brought Mickey Thomas in, you know, in in the January time. We'd lost 1-0 at uh, Blackburn Rovers in in the third round. Um, And then... During that week, John had signed Mickey Thomas, who of course Joey and Mickey uh, are four years older than me, but they they were they were the best mates anyway. And then to bring Mickey and who I played with as well at Wrexham, it it just it just was fantastic for us. And all of a sudden, from that moment on, I think I don't think we lost a game, you know. 
Mm-hmm. And and John always thought of Mickey as if Mickey could Mickey because he he had such an engine, and uh, he was such a character. But he was so well loved by everybody because his work rate was incredible. He could do two jobs. He could be a left winger. He could be an inside left. He could play. He could play in a three in midfield. He could play wide left. Mickey was just an incredible footballer, one of the fittest footballers I've ever seen. And in fact, probably one of the only footballers who, who I feel were fitter than Mickey, Dennis Wise. You know, again, a great, great captain for Chelsea. But what people don't realise is how fit this guy was. And, and I was fortunate to play with Mickey Thomas and I was fortunate to be part of the staff when Dennis Wise was at the club. And uh, how fitness plays such an important part in their roles at the club. Now we move on to the next season and one of the sort of iconic games that Chelsea Football Club still sort of talk about and I know fans to this day still talk about is the first game of the season away to Arsenal. Kerry Dixon scored the goal where as soon as he scored, the whole stand just erupted. Thousands of Chelsea fans again took over that pretty much the ground that day. But what was the atmosphere like for you as, as the goalkeeper there? And how did you feel knowing that you was playing in the first division? Well, first of all, it was a great achievement, you know. Um, and also to go to Highbury, incredible stadium. Uh, and, and don't forget, that game was kicked off early. We kicked off early that day. I think it was about that 11.30. That was on police kickoff. advice, wasn't it? If I believe I so. Remember, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, but there you go. I believe so. Anyway, I, you, I've spoken about Peter Bernetti, but I'll tell you a quick story that saddens me in a way because of the number of great games that Peter had. Um, we were walking down the tunnel to do the warm-up and, uh, and he said to me, listen to the crowd when I come down. Just listen to the crowd when I come out. And when he came out, their crowd started singing Mexico. They were looking back to that game in Mexico where people blamed Peter for, for one of the goals. And I'm thinking, how sad is this? And yet he was so strong mentally, he could cope with it. And he was teaching me in that game. So it doesn't matter about, you know, everything else that's going on around you. You deal with it. You don't, you don't play the occasion. You deal with the mat. You deal with the, the ball. And uh, I always remember him saying that to me. And I thought, well, this guy was a great and you're trying to take the mick out of him. OK, but it was like, you know, he just brushed it off. He was just uh, just a great guy. The game itself, um, Paul Mariner, I think he scored for the uh, for the Arsenal. I believe so, yeah. And I think Kerry equalised. Oh, listen, it was a great day. It was a great atmosphere. Of course, we were happy to come away from there because they were a huge club. We wanted to prove ourselves. We'd done really well the season before, but of course you do well the season before means nothing because now you're starting at a higher level. Hmm. Uh, and we coped and it gave us great confidence. And of course, for a, you know, for a goal scorer like Kerry, the confidence it gave him as well was, was, was brilliant. And uh, I think the other thing I can remember from that game was obviously Doug Rufy making his debut. And I think he put, I think he was it Viv Anderson? And I think he put him in the paddock. One of his favourite tackles, <laughs> you know? You know, and you know, Joey could tackle. <laughs> this, this is one of Joey's tackles, I think. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. So, uh, listen, it was a, it was a, it was a good day for us. Of course, we'd have loved to have won the game, but to come in there, come away from there with a one-one draw, and uh, and also again, I was playing against one of my idols. You know, and uh, they, there's a saying that uh, work hard enough that your heroes become your rivals, and Pat Jennings was one of my heroes. And he was on the other end that day. So uh, it was a special day and always remember. And by the way, another special guy. Mm, Absolutely. But as well, that season for Chelsea did end up being quite a memorable one. We finished sixth in in the league and we got Mm. to the semi-final of the League Cup. For a promoted side, even by today's standards, that's quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen, we had great belief. As I say, confidence is a great thing in football. We 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 had the confidence from from playing together for a season. Obviously, the season before, you know, we had uh, a really strong squad. Uh, we had players who could come on and impact the game. And when you had a front line of uh, Nevin, Speedy, and Dixon, you know, then then we were a real threat. And we knew that if we keep those those players on the pitch, then we would always create chances. And you asked me about John earlier and. 
you know, one of the things and the simple things he used to say even before a game, he used to put the ball on the medical bench. You know, in those days, the treatment bed was in the middle of the middle of the home dressing room, put the ball on the bench and say, give the ball to the little fella. If you give the ball to the wee man, we'll have more chance of winning than, than not. And, and and that's that's how simple it was. Simple as that, yeah. Simple as that. So win your battles, win your 1v1s, have a nice shape about you. You know the team, you know the way we're going to play, give the ball apart. And we knew that we give the ball apart. And we knew that David and Kerry could cause huge problems, you know. And sorry, and I got it, you know. And then, you know, with people like Canners, who could, you know, I mentioned these guys. But we had Canners, you know, yeah. who could come and influence the game. Yeah. You know, great influence on game. You know, we had with Dale Jasper coming through as well, who could come and handle himself in midfield. And you know, so you're talking about Bunners and we got Spackers, and so we, you know, we had a, we had a good squad. Now, fast forward a little bit, where. To eighty five, John Neal left the club, and John yeah. Mullins took over. Was you surprised with this decision that John Hollins took over? Because I know John Neal sort of left due to ill health around that sort of time. Was you surprised that John Hollins took over? Or did you feel that was a more natural fit? Um, I think everybody felt it was a natural fit. I mean, obviously, we was we were shocked to lose John. Uh, personally as well, from a personal level, of course. Mm. I knew he'd always be on the end of the phone if I needed to speak to him. Um, but obviously, it was a shock to us already left. Of course, him and Ian McNeil, who doesn't get a lot enough credit as well, actually, because of the people and the, the talent spotting that he did. Um, you know, we had a really good staff. And it was really... Uh, but it was a natural progression because John, again, was such a huge figure in the history of Chelsea. You know, long before I became involved in the club, and uh, he was a well liked, really terrific professional, and uh, he was a great character. Hmm. So uh, it was a natural progression for him, and obviously it must have been difficult for him, though. Obviously, because now he's, uh, you know, now if he's coming from being in the dressing room with us to, and, and okay, he was player coach as well, but now becoming the the top man. Yeah, and um, yeah, it was very difficult for him, I'm sure. Was but there... we were all, but we, but we were all right behind it, you know, Keith. Right. We always, we wanted to do so well for him. I was, I was, that's what I was going to sort of. My next question was: Was there any sort of teammates that you felt maybe didn't see that as in John Hollins was the natural successor, or did you? Sort of, was there anybody that was against the idea of it, or again, not that I can remember? Not, yeah. not, not, not that I can remember, and, and those kind of things don't really interest him, interest me, mate. You know. Um, the team is the most important thing, hmm. not individuals. It's the team that's the most important thing. And don't forget, you know, you win as a team, you lose as a team. Yeah. You take victory together, you take defeats together. And really, you know, you, no, you don't only aspire to be the best in the team. You want to be the best for the team. Hmm. And that means everybody pulling in the right direction. So, uh, no, that never came into it. No, not at all. Never came into it at all. You know, we were right behind John and... Uh, we, you know, of course, he'd shared our successes as well going back. And don't forget how important it was because he'd been successful as a young player with Chelsea as well. Now he's coming back as a 34, 35 year old, I believe, you know, and he's sharing those experiences with, with us. Hmm. So there was a, you know, he, he was a great character. Now, that season, the 85 86 season, Chelsea as a club were going okay in the league. Unfortunately, against QPR, you did pick up a serious injury, which would culminate in your early retirement. I want to sort of delve into the weeds a little bit with this, but before we talk talk about the injury itself, what was your initial thoughts when you picked up the injury at the time? Did you think that this was something of a minor issue or did did you think at that point this could be a long-term injury? Obviously not thinking about retirement that age, but something more that this could take me out for at least a few months? Well, I'll give you a build-up to the game first, OK? Because I always remember it. Because on the Sunday, we played at Everton. And, of course, again, I'm playing against my great mate, Neville Southall, who, by the way, we both played in the same under-11s team out. Oh, wow. And we used to, oh. and it was called Landino and District. And we were both playing out. We were both defenders. And, actually, I was the captain of that team. So, you remind him of that, if you think. <laughs> so, I'm big Neville myself. We're big mates from, you know, uh, years gone by. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we drew the game 1-1. And, of course, I was his understudy. his number two, if you like. I used to carry his bags, make his tea, watching me eat his fried egg butties in the room. 
going away with Wales. <laughs> uh, anyway, after the game, he said to me, and this was on the Sunday, we were playing the QPR game on the Wednesday. He said to me, Ed, I got a problem with my foot. I might have to pull out of the Welsh game in Ireland next week. So, you know, you might get a game. I hadn't played. I carried his bags for so many games. I said, okay, cheers now. Anyway, on the Wednesday, I got, obviously, I got the injury. Um, and the week after, he played against the Republic of Ireland at Lansdowne Road and broke his ankle. He dislocated his ankle. So how ironic is that? Mm. Anyway, uh, remember the injury, remember the night. Uh, we were drawing, I think it was at the time. We might have been 1 0 up, actually. I think we were 1 0 up. And a corner came in uh, at the scoreboard end. And in those days, the, as you remember, we're saying about the great Chelsea and the great Stamford Bridge, but the pitch was never great. Eh? Might have been good for six games of the season, but after that, it was a disaster. Not throughout the season, no, no. You know, not like, not like it is today. Anyway. <laughs> You, the, the goal match used to camber hmm. and there was a drop it used to drop away outside the, the near post and the far post anyway the corner came in against Queen's Park Rangers it got head up and headed up in the air on the near post I came over the top of people I punched the ball as I'm coming down I know I'm struggling I know something's not right here as I hit the floor my knee buckles and then unfortunately big Steve Wicks who again is another big Chelsea icon from the past yeah. Unfortunately, it was QPR. He landed on top of me and it crushed my leg, crushed my knee. So all of a sudden, I feel this excruciating pain. And what you find, Keith, is that when you do your cruciate ligament, you've got your anterior and your posterior, your two right. main ones. Well, they cross. And when, they, when, when the injury happened, they snapped. And the nerve endings on the end, of, they tingle. You know, this is the how I can explain it to you. And, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's happening? What's happened? What's happened? And Norma Medhurst came on and, you know, gave me the treatment. And after two minutes, the pain had gone. So I'm thinking, wow. Anyway, but known to me, they had another corner, so I must have punched it out. When the corner came in again, I caught it. And Terry Fennick hit me from the side again. You know, in those days, a little bit different to what you get today, I suppose, but... The referee gave me a free kick. And people have always asked me, why did you take why did you take the gold kick? I didn't feel any pain. My nerve endings un unbeknown to me had become numb. So of course I put the ball down. As I planted my leg to kick and I put weight on it, it just collapsed. And it was like just it was just loose. Just felt loose and horrible and and in the end and uh I'll go on to, I'm lying on the floor. And another really good friend of mine who was with the Welsh national team at the time was playing for QPR. And that's Robbie James, who of course died at 40. But he's playing in this game. I go down on the floor and all I can remember was Robbie saying to me, come on, Ed, get up. We're away with Wales next week. We really enjoyed the camaraderie of being with the national team. Come on, you know. And, uh, but of course, I couldn't continue. And uh, I went in the dressing room, was put on crutches. And uh, yeah, and then obviously the next day I had an examination where they actually flushed my knee out. Um, but two weeks later, and then I tried to come back and uh, unfortunately it collapsed again. So that's when obviously the start of all my problems began. Uh, 18 months down the line. Six six operations later, trying to come back. Um, and I had come and I'd come back and I was playing, but there was always a there was always a position I would get in that I had to make an adjustment. So I knew I was needing another operation. And uh anyway, in the end, I had two young boys at the end. My eldest son at the time was four, my youngest one was two, and the surgeon came to me and he said, Ed, he said, I'm sorry, but I have to do this operation but you won't be able to play at the level that you're at now. Yeah. And uh, if it goes again, you could, be, you could end up with a permanent limp. You know, so as harsh as it was and as hard as it was, I really didn't have a decision to make. The decision was made for me. 
So, of course, that was a very difficult time. But, you know, uh, I lost one, I lost one career. But then, obviously, mm. Chelsea gave me the opportunity yeah. to create another career, which I'm always forever grateful of. Sort of looking back from that game and sort of the aftermath from that, was there any animosity between you and Steve Wicks over that obviously no. incident? No, 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 no. I mean, in fact, Steve was very good. He kept in contact with me. You know, I saw him uh, in March at Peter's uh, memorial at the bridge. We sat next mm. to one another. You know, and I got Dave Seaman one side of me. I got Steve Wicks the other side of me. Both six foot three, six foot four, and I'm in the middle. So, so, <laughs> no, I mean, no, 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 no. It was a complete accident. It was just one of them, one of them things that happened. And unfortunately, uh, I got myself in the wrong place at the wrong time on in in my penalty area, and in my a, living room, as I called it. Well, I was going to say as well. It's a bit ironic that you picked up the injury, the, the position you know that you was most famous from, but. How disappointed was you as well? Because that season we got to the full Members' Cup final at Wembley when we would play Man City. Was you at that game or was you sort of at home oh, yeah. recuperating? No, no. No, no. I'd had, the opera- I'd had an operation and uh, I went to the game. It was 5-4, of course. That's right. But all I, can remember, all I can remember was coming on the pitch on my crutches or coming out from the tunnel on my crutches and the Chelsea fans singing my name. Brilliant. So it was... Uh, what an uplift that, what a boost that was, you know. And I, I was lucky that, you know, from day one, I always had this association with the supporters. Mm. And I think, you know, as a player, what you are is you're a supporter in the, sh- in the shirt for them. You know, and it's that, it's that bond, that closeness. And uh, I was lucky that I always appreciated them. Fortunately for me, they appreciated what I could do for them, hopefully. And uh, we had a great affinity, and we still do now. Whenever I go to the bridge, and you know, people recognise me. It's uh, it's lovely. You miss it because mm. you were still part of the sort of Chelsea side b- before you did announce your retirement. You were still part of it around the eighty seven eighty eight season. That would be the season subsequently we would go down through the relegation yep. playoff. Obviously, that Chelsea side was a little bit different from what it was in 84 and 85. Did you notice anything different in terms of how the players acted around each other? Because there was, obviously, when we've had other people on the show, like Wicks or Tony DiRigo, for example, they did sort of mention that there were certain cliques in the squad and, you know, all was not well as a happy camp. Did you sort of see that from the outside, obviously, looking in? Was Or was there any, was there sort of more rumours into that? about how the how the squad was as a whole? Um, very difficult question. Uh, if I'm perfectly honest with you, I was, never in, I was never interested in anything like that. I like to get on with most people. Um, I can't remember anything like that. I must admit to you, I was never made aware of anything like that. Um, the only thing I'd say to you is that when you're, when you're winning football matches, then it's great. Everybody's patting you on the back and, you, you know, Obviously, it's easier to create that team spirit when you're not winning football matches, and it's quick. It's 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 quite easy to start pointing the fingers elsewhere rather than look in the mirror yourself. Mm. Um, so, but uh, no, I I was I was never aware of that. I must admit. I mean, you're talking about that season again. I spoke about the 31st of October 1970. It was it was the 31st of October when I got injured against Oxford, and that was my last game in 1987. Yeah. Um, so, listen. No, I never said it, but to be honest, they had my own problems at that time, you know, dealing with the injury. Understandable, yeah. Mentally, mentally trying to de- deal with it. And uh, what I did do, and I and I really enjoyed doing this, and I think it really helped me at the start and even now in my coaching career, I always wanted to be that we were the team. I always thought, thought that I had something to offer that I could help them, you know, in whatever aspect it was, because I'd experienced things. And as a goalkeeper, people, some people think the goalkeepers can't coach, for instance. My answer to that is, well, give us a chance. And also, don't forget, we can see everything that's going on in front of us. Yeah. Now, I want to sort of start going to talk about your coaching career, especially with Chelsea. When yeah. did you decide? Did you decide while you was playing that you wanted to be a, a coach? Or was it because of the injury that you felt, right, 
this is what I need to do. I'll get into coaching. But when did you initially decide goalkeeping coach was the best thing for you? Well, actually, I've got to correct you because um, what basically happened was that uh, I'd had my operation um, and I think it was around the February, February, March time where I was approached by the club to go with the reserve team for the last two, three months of the season. And they could have a look at me and I could have a look at whether I wanted to do that type of work. Right. Um, fortunately for me, they saw something in my ability to help the club in that position at that time. And at the end of that season, when, you know, contractually I knew that, that I wasn't going to carry on playing, the club then came to me and they offered me the youth team coach's job um, and also, you know, doing the goalkeepers part time because by that time Peter had uh, left us. So uh, I agreed, and uh, and that's what I did, and that's what I did. And, and basically, then I had to go and do my badges. I had to go and get my qualifications. I had to learn off people, and I, you know, I lent on people. And you know, for instance, when I was doing the youth team, and I had I had a gentleman called Dave Collier, who was a, an amateur goalkeeper himself with Sutton United, um, but also a teacher. And unfortunately, he died at 56 with a brain tumour. But without, without, without him, I'd have been, you know, I'd have been in a canoe without a paddle. Hmm. He, was, he was a great help and a great coach and somebody who I learned off greatly, along with many others at the club at that time. So the club stood by me, um, you know, and, and helped me. And, um, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. But obviously, I, I really relied on the staff and the people around the club at that time as well. And for you personally, was it difficult for you to transition from being a player in the training ground to then being the goalkeeping coach? Did it take you a while to adapt or was it quite quick in that transition? Oh, crikey, yeah. No, no. It took... Oh, no, no, no. Uh... Listen, when you're a player and you do your work and, you know, I love my work on the training ground and, I, you know, obviously, listen, I used to stay out on the training ground for ages. Maybe that might have been part of my downfall because maybe I might put too much stress on my body. I don't know. But when you're working with somebody like Peter Benetti, you want to just progress. Um, but no, no, no. I, I, it, it helped me greatly to, uh, as I say, to be around the club and it helped me progress. But, it, I didn't have it in my mind as a 27-year-old that I was going to be a coach. I had it in my mind that maybe when I got to 40 and it might have been time for me to hang on my gloves, then I wanted to be a coach. Um, but I think you don't think of it. I think I think I grew up in an era where most players thought, oh, great, if I could carry on in the game, you know, and be, be involved in the game in some capacity one way or another. Mm. I think now where, you, you know, you have so many different avenues um, then obviously people make make their own choices. But for me, I mean, I'm lucky that here I am today, 47 years plus in the game. And, you know, I left school at 16 as a young boy from a council estate in North Wales. And I'm still in the game, at, you know, 47 years later. And I can only be grateful, but, you know, a little bit proud as well hmm. that I'm hanging in there, if you like, but not just surviving. I'm trying to, now I'm trying to help those younger breed to, um, you know, get better and share, of course, share the experiences that I've had, you know, uh, over many years in the game. Absolutely. And, you know, you became the goalkeeping coach for Chelsea around sort of the early 90s, mid 90s, where Chelsea as a club really pushed on from the 80s. And sort of what stories do you have of, sort of players that you worked with or sort of players that were part of the, of, of Chelsea? You know, going to that point where then all of a sudden Glenn Hoddle would be the manager and then Rude Hullet would turn up and Mark Hughes, for example. You know, that that must have really sort of been a, a, a huge change to, for you to see on the training ground these star players being there and then you would be working with the likes of Kevin Hitchcock or Dimitri Karin. What sort of stories do you have of that particular era at Chelsea? Crikey! Well, well. First of all, I mean, one of the big iconic, big. I keep using this word iconic. One of the one of the guys who were like a real mentor for me before, just before this time, was Don Howe. 
of course, had, had had a wonderful coaching career, 125 times going with England and four World Cups. And, you know, talking about somebody, he was a mentor, a huge mentor for me, and, and he'd done so much at the club. Obviously, he left and we had a short spell, I think it was, with, with Dave Webb. And then, obviously, uh, the chairman brought in Glenn Hoddle. And, uh, you know, Glenn is, is and still is to this day, you know, one of the best players, if not the best player that I ever played against, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I knew him. I knew him through playing against him. We played together against one another, you know, 18 years of age. And uh, he said to me, Ed, he said, listen, he said, I've been told to keep you. But I don't know if we can work together. Obviously, I've known you through doing the travelling and whatever, going to games. So, you know, I'll tell you by Christmas. So don't worry, just get on with your job. Anyway, and then he, then I was pulled and I was said, oh, I've got a job for you, by the way. OK, what's that? He said, I want you to go to, I want you to, go to Denmark and I want you to go and watch a centre-half called Jakob Kelberg. Do you remember Jakob, huh? Yes, we had him on the show last year for an interview. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. So... I was sent on a Sunday to Denmark, to Jutland. He played for a team called Silkeborg. Mm. And uh, I liked what I saw. So I came back and he asked me what I thought. I told him. He went to see the player on the Thursday. He liked what he saw. He came back and he said, Ed, he says, you'll do for me. I think the same as you. I'm going to sign him and you're staying with me. So how for? Wow. You know? So I've got this guy, I've got this guy who's now showing confidence in me. And I'm thinking, well, we're singing off the same sheet, song sheet here, you know? So that was great. And uh, we worked closely together. Uh, he was unbelievable, unbelievable player, an incredible coach, way above his time. I still tell young coaches today and people, listen, listen to Glenn Hoddle, listen to the Graham Soonesses of this world. Mm. Just hang on every, their every word because they know the game. They can see two or three steps ahead. Oh, this awesome. is why Glenn, Glenn was so great. You know, people used to say he had eyes on the, on the back of his head because he was that good. Mm-hmm. You know, in those days, as player manager, uh, Peter Shreves was his, was his assistant manager again, a great guy. Right. And uh, they used to do a lot of technical drills to start off with whatever. And he'd always use Glenn to demo. And Glenn could do everything. He, could, he was just incredible with the football. And um, nah, that, was, that, was, that was great times. And then, of course, because we'd signed Glenn and he was this huge figure, then all of a sudden then you can attract the likes of your, your Rude Hullets and your Gianluca Viales, you know, and, and all these great players who came and your Dan Petrescu's and your Zolas. Yeah. And then on from that, you know, we build and we go to Gus Poyer and then you go... You're talking about Marcel Desailly and uh, and uh, Didier Deschamps, and the list goes on. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, so Glenn was great, and uh, let me get on with the job. And again, Dimitri Kari, and I was sent to watch Dimitri Kari. First time I'd ever been to the New Camp. Dimitri played. I saw him the other week. Actually, he's goalkeeping coach at Hemel Hempstead. That's right. And, That's right. And uh, still a great character, still a good guy, and um, he. He was playing for Seska Moscow and uh, Gwyn Williams has said to me, make sure you get there early because, uh, you know, watch him in his warm-up. And they couldn't beat him. There was about 40,000 in this huge 100,000-seater stadium in the Nou Camp. First time I've ever been at Barcelona in the Nou Camp. And I'm watching this this guy and uh, I'm thinking, oh, my God, wow. But he's still warm and he's still got his tracksuit bottoms on. <laughs> so, anyway, you know, we signed him. And uh, again, I mentioned Steve Francis earlier on, most wonderful soft hands. Uh, He had a spring like Zebedee and a stretch like Olga Corbett, I used to say, because he was that flexible. You know, he was like, I used to ask him about his flexibility. And he says, hey, Res, you're in Russia already. No problem, no problem. When you're three years of age, you do gymnastics, no problem. You know, and that was him. That was Dimmy. And, uh, you know, so... Again, that was, uh, that was a good story. Of course, I had Kevin Hitchcock, who is one of the bravest goalkeepers I ever worked with. You know, I, I still play golf with Kevin to this day. He's doing a great job. In fact, in fact, Kevin Hitchcock must be now one of the most experienced and qualified goalkeeping coaches with such worldwide knowledge in the world. Because now, 
Kevin is with the New England, and of course he's been with Franco. He's been with Franco in guitar. Yeah. He's been with Franco in many places, you know, as well as with us. And uh, he's now working for New England Revolution. That's right. Boston, and of course Michael Turner went from uh, New England to New the England. Arsenal. Arsenal, yeah. Yeah, and now he's got another goalkeeper who he likes. So, you know, he, it's, uh, Kevin must be, and he, he's a great guy, great competitor, mm. and uh, super character. And um, yeah, again, can't speak highly enough of him. So I was lucky that, you know, I'm going now and I'm working with great guys. And of course, you know, we had big Dave Bez. Uh, yes, yeah. Again, a great character, great personality. Um, you know, and then it goes on. You know, I remember being at home one day and all of a sudden somebody phoned me up and said, oh, by the way, we signed Ed Dachui. And uh, he said a little bit more than that, actually, but I'm not giving that one. <laughs> anyway, uh, again, you know, what a goalkeeper, what a goalkeeper Ed was for, for Chelsea. Um, you know, being Frode Grodas, you know, going to Lillestrøm in, in Norway and going to see him on a, on a playing for Lillestrøm in the Norwegian League and then, saying, yeah, yeah, you know, he'll do for us, he'll do a job for us. And, of course, you know, he did do a job for us. We, he was going to go in the 1998 Cup final. final. 97 Cup Final, there you go. And then yeah, he, he was in goal, yeah. You know, and the year after he went to the uh, the year after he went to the World Cup with Norway and he gave me one of his shirts, God bless him. Oh, so, when he's now goalkeeper. Now he works as the goalkeeping uh, coach in, in Norway. So, you know, great, great guys. You know, wonderful experience. And, of course, then, Sort of Carlo Cudicini, mm. you know uh, Gianluca. Gianluca brings Carlo Cudicini in uh, and says, uh, "Listen, we're going to have Carlo for two weeks, and I need a decision. He's going to cost one hundred and sixty thousand pounds, and we need a decision." So, you know, we're, we're Carlo, and uh, easy, easy. You know, I mean, at that time, and of course, he comes in and he's. You know, what people don't realise about Carlo is that his father was, was voted the best goalkeeper for Milan yeah. uh, in the last century. He was called the Black, he had a nickname called the, the Black Spider. So he had a goalkeeping pedigree anyway, um, but a wonderful goalkeeper. And he did a great job for Chelsea, didn't he? You know, so, uh, and he's still working there today. He's, that's so, right. Uh, yes. Great memories. <laughs> you know, great memories. And I'm working with, with top goalkeepers. So I was lucky. Was there a, one goalkeeper that you worked with that you felt could go far, but for whatever reason didn't? And I mean, not in terms of being becoming a world class goalkeeper, but in terms of somebody that had potential, but perhaps didn't make the grade. Was there anybody that stood out for you when you, while you was at Chelsea Whoa. with the goalkeeping Whoa. department? I'll, I'll give you a goalkeeper that I have worked with, but it wasn't at Chelsea who. I still believe him, but was very fortunate with an England with an injury he had when he played for England, and that's Jack Butland. Right. This kid, this kid as a young goalie, had so much talent, mm. so much talent, and uh, you know he took over from when we were at Stoke. He took over from Asmir Begovic, did very well, and then we had a few problems in the back line. A lot of people changed. And I'll go back to my early my career at Chelsea. I was very, very, very fortunate that I had Colin Pates and John McLaughlin in front of me, mm. and that hardly changed. Mm. I had we had this golden golden triangle where I've got guys in front of me who I got loads of trust. You know, I got Colin Lee, John Holland initially, but then Colin Lee is the right back who converted from a centre forward. You know, and then I got Joey Jones, one of my best mates, if not my best mate playing left back. left back so I knew that if I got dragged near post I had these guys that could clear the ball on the back post for me you know and then I got Colin Colin and Joe who were so secure so professional Colin should have played many many games for England wonderful left foot great reader of the game could pick a pass could come out from defence with the ball was a really good captain um, so you know it's uh, so I was I was fortunate that I had this triangle in front of me all of a sudden, George, well, I'm talking about Jack. Jack didn't have it, and he's still a young kid growing. But, he, you know, listen, he had an injury with England. He's never quite recovered from that, I believe. But he's at Crystal Palace, and, you know, he's oh, probably he's about 28 now. I believe uh, so, yeah. But he's, yeah. yeah, but he's still got, you know, listen, goalkeepers can go on. Mm. And uh, I still have confidence in, in Jack, if I'm honest with you. 
and you must have special memories when we talk talk about Chelsea in that era of the late nineties, going into the two thousands, of being in the dugout for some incredible moments where it would be like the Cup Winners Cup final in ninety eight and Zola with yeah. that cracker against Stuttgart. Absolutely. Or the Champions League campaign of you know when Chelsea would play AC Milan at Stamford Bridge or right bit nil nil, but to have the likes of Milan and Barcelona at Stamford Bridge at that period would just be sensational. And then you've got the FA Cup final in two thousand, the you know, the yeah. last to be played at that old Wembley. To be in the dugout for, for those sort of memories and iconic moments for the club, looking back on it, does that sort of give you a huge sense of pride and sort of knowing that you was you, you had a small part in that, bearing in mind that you was the goalkeeping coach and you was the one that to help the likes of Kevin Hitchcock and Ed De Hoy and a young Carlo Cudicini mould into being the goalkeepers that they were for the club. Well, of course, it's you know to work with work with special guys. It's it's always important, and uh, you know as I say, I, I take great satisfaction in, in you know doing that, and I felt that that they'd improved. Um, but also to be involved in the kind of players that were known worldwide. But the, you know, one of the important things was is these guys came and they came to work. Hmm. They came to work. They didn't come just to take the money and live in London. Uh, they were a credit to themselves, credit to their family, credit to Chelsea. So just told that just shows you that, that you know, even even today, you get your recruitment right and you've got more chance of winning than losing. Hmm. You know, if you get the recruitment wrong, then watch out, watch out because you'll be losing your job. Mm. And uh, these guys came. You know, you've you've mentioned. I'll mention a story where 1998, France had won the World Cup, and we've signed Didier, and we've signed uh, Marcel. So, what had happened was that. Uh, in those days, we used to play our reserve games at Kingstonian. And our first game of every pre-season was against, King, against Kingstonian for Chelsea's first team, or the squad players who had came back. Of course, um, Marcel and Didier had been given longer off because of the World Cup campaign and obviously being successful. But they happened to have their first training session back on the day that we were playing at Kingstonian in this game. So I was asked to stay behind and take these guys training with some of the younger players and give them a session so that, you know, just to get their legs moving again and what have you. Uh, I think Adi Maffi was also with me that day as the assistant fi- uh, fitness coach. Yeah. 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 And uh, anyway, they came in and of course we were all like, you know, the guys had gone off to Kingstonian to play the game. I had about 10 players along with Marcel and uh, and Didier. So I'm thinking, good God, what am I going to coach? What am I going to teach them coming in? <laughs> coming in, World Cup winners, you know, incredible people as well. So I thought, oh, listen, how do you warm them up? We'll give them some ball work. We'll give them a five-a-side, you know? Let them enjoy, get get their legs yeah. moving again, whatever. Yeah. So that Addy had warmed them. I'm sure it was Addy who had warmed them up. Next minute they came in. The game had been going about, five, six minutes. Next minute, Marcel shouted to me, coach, coach, if you finish the session now, it will be the best session I've ever had. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so I think I carried on for about two minutes and said, that's enough guys. That's good for me. <laughs> you know, what a man. And, uh, you know, you're talking about, you're talking about what a player, by the way, but you're talking about stories. So, you know, we all still hear the crowd singing. When Wisey scored at the San Siro yes. and I was there, well, I tell you what, what a, what a night that was because also I was there and it's one of the best, if not the best reception I've ever seen from a visiting player back to his old club. And Marcel Desai came out that night in the San Siro for the warm up, mm. and the whole ground erupted, you know, and it was just wow, it was just wow, you know, one of those moments that you think, oh, please, you know. Come on, please, please let it last a bit longer, you know. So, uh, yeah, great stories and, and great man and great player, by the way. Wow, That's superb! Just sort of again sort of knowing, obviously, with Desai, what he achieved at Milan, and then we're saying about him returning to Chelsea. Yeah, that was that must be a 
I mean, listen, you know, we had Frank Barely as well, by the way. Hmm? We had Frank LeBeuf as well. Yeah, well, small matter well. of another World Cup winner as well with uh, for Frank LeBeuf, you know. I mean, and people, people seem to think Chelsea existed, you know, after 2003. I, 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 no, no. We had Chappie Ferrer. It looked like Albert Ferrer, Ferrer. Yeah. Chappy Ferrer. We went, to, we went to Barcelona and next minute there's all these things on the wall and, you, and there's his name on the wall. And you say, what's that for? He was voted in the best Barcelona team of that, that period. You know, of a ten-year period or whatever it was, like and you're thinking, unbelievable. You know, you're talking about these players. I mean, I remember, you know, remember like a, a six-a-side tournament we did at Harlington and Dan Petrescu playing with Zolan in the same team. It was like, you know, it was it was just like unbelievable. <laughs> you know, just, oh, just, just fabulous, just fabulous. You know, we, don't forget we got Baba. Bobby Yarrow coming as a 17 year old from Andalek. Yes. Yeah. You know, you know, um, go and watch him, go and watch him. 17 playing as a, oh, playing as a left sided centre back in a three. Are you the one that had a look at him beforehand and gave r- recommendations? One of the ones. One of the he ones. Was one of them. I won't he take all the credit. Them. I was one <laughs> of the ones because there was many of us. There was many of us. There's a lot of good people in the background. You know, yeah. Gwyn Williams, Mick McGiven, and all these guys who would go and watch these games, watch these games. and you know, oh, the amount of mileage that was done spotting and looking for these players who would come through for the club. Oh, wow. Wow. Mick they McGibbon and myself, when we, when we went in the Champions League, when we were in the Champions League and one of our other jobs was to go and scout the opposition. So before you play, Mick McGibbon and myself went to Galatasaray. Galatasaray were playing, I think it was Stahl Bucharest. And we we had to do we had to do analysis on both teams because they were coming up against them in the Champions League, you know. So we had great trips, great trips, and great experience, you know. Wonderful, well, just wonderful to hear. I want to fast forward though to the next season, the two thousand two thousand and one season. Then, unfortunately, you left Chelsea. It was around about the November time. Yeah, Ranieri was brought in in the September when Viali uh, got sacked. Yeah. What was the conversations like between you and Claudio? Did did you sort of know when Viali got sacked that things was maybe changing for you personally with Chelsea? Or did you think that maybe if you speak to have after having conversations with Claudio that you might be able to stay on at Chelsea. What 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 was the timeline for that between when the timeline, got sacked well, and well okay first of all sorry to interrupt you first of all no, 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 uh, fine. Uh, Gianluca Viali what a guy what a guy you'd work with him on the training ground and he would berate himself if he missed the target from twelve yards. His professionalism was incredible the way he lived his life the way he ate the way he was uh, don't forget his family were, you know, self-made millionaires in their own right. And yet you had this guy who would give everything for the cause and more. Blood, sweat and tears. What a guy. Remember him doing, you know, when he became player manager and standing in front of a flip chart. And Luca had this Luca had this thing at halftime where he'd always drop his shorts for some reason around his ankles. And he'd be standing there with his shorts around his ankles with his with his slip on and doing a team talk, you know, but it was superstition, but, you know, just, just, just like absolutely incredible guy. And, and we were so, so sad to lose him. And, uh, you know, he was so generous as well. So uh special person still is. And I uh, know he's had his difficulties and, uh, you know, we'll, we all reach out for him because he, he's a special guy and hopefully absolutely. he'll pull through. Um, right. Well, in, in the situation, of course, Ray Wilkins was, was, again, you know, incredible coach, incredible guy who, you know, helped so many managers, so many different players would share his experiences. And again, Chelsea through and through. Hmm. But when Claudio came, um, I was also assistant manager with Wales, uh, where Mark Hughes was doing as well, part-time and that. So uh, I'd gone away. I'd been for the first week or two at the club, but then I went away with Wales. And when I came back, of course, Claudio had his goalkeeping, uh, Giorgio Pelle, I've been Pelle, I'm not sure it was Pellegrino, but anyway, he, Giorgio was now Pellezzoli. He was now doing the goalkeepers 
And I really wasn't doing that much. I was helping with the younger players, younger goalkeepers. Right. But it came to a head where one day I came in and uh, Claudio didn't speak good English at this time. And uh, he'd asked Ray to interpret. said, listen, Eddie, um, you know, we don't think it's right that you're still here, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, we think we should come to an agreement that you should leave. Um, and that's how it basically happened. And of course, listen, I was I was bitter at the time, very bitter, hurt by it. Um, senior players had got together and actually asked the club and asked the manager for me to stay, which I'm forever grateful for. They were incredible. Um, why is he being one of them? And uh, But it came to a head where the club didn't really have a position for me. So I had to leave after giving so much and it hurt. But during that time, um, George Armstrong, the old winger uh, for Arsenal, unfortunately, uh, who was a friend of mine, we'd had many a games with our reserves team against Arsenal. We got on great. Um, he died. He had a brain tumour at 56 on the training ground and collapsed and died. Uh Three weeks later, I got a call from Pat Rice saying, listen, Ed, what are you doing? I told him of my situation at Chelsea was coming to a head. And he said, well, listen, I've recommended you to Arsene Wenger. Uh, do you fancy the job? Uh, I said, great. Can I? He says, can you come and have a chat? I went and had a chat. And uh, it was an honour for me to go there and try and take up a position that uh, an incredible figure in the game for the Arsenal and, and what a man George Armstrong was that, uh, you know, and I was forever grateful for Pat for putting me forward. And uh, that's how I ended up being at the Arsenal. And uh, again, I had a wonderful time there, but of course, adjusting from being, you know, a blue to now a red yeah. again and, and whatever. Um, but I had to get on with it and I did. And uh, I learned so much. I learned so much from the staff there, you know, and uh, from Arsenal. And I was going back there and I, Don Howe, who was there doing the youth team. Liam Brady was running the youth team against one of the best players I ever played against. Um, Pat Rice was, was with, with the boss, with the boss I call him, and with uh, Bora Primorac. And um, we had a fitness coach called Tony Colbert, who was a wonderful guy, wonderful in, in terms of dealing with injured players or dealing with the ball, getting players back fit. I knew the I knew a lot of the guys there in terms of Gary Lewin, Colin Lewin, who had been the physio for England as well. So mm. Gary Lewin, sorry. So uh, yeah, it was it was great. And to be honest, it was near my home, so I was very fortunate in one respect, and so fortunate to to move lose one job, mm. but you know, literally quite soon after moving into another job, and that's how it happened, really. And did you get any feedback from people like Gwen Williams or? Mick McGovern or even Colin Hutchinson about the fact that you was being relieved of your duties? Did they sort of have a chat with you about it or anything? Oh, or yeah, yeah, just... yeah. They get, No, no, absolutely. And they gave me great advice. But, you know, once, listen, once the manager makes his decision, hmm. then you have to accept that, you know. And as I said to you, I was quite bitter at the time. But, but you know, I, you look back now and, and you know, you've got, to, you've got to appreciate that when you're the manager of a football club and you go in, then, you you know, most of the time, they take their own staff, mm. and 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 it puts other people's jobs at, 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 in jeopardy. And uh, that's what happened to me. I understand that more now than at the time, um, because Chelsea was my life. You know, you don't spend seventeen years at a football club, more or less, and and then you know sweep it under the carpet. Yeah. You know, you you just don't do that. And it was it was my life, and uh, I had so many great memories there. Um, and I still have, I still have, and it's it's great to go back, um, you know, and it's it's great to see people, and it's great to see people who still work there, and I still remember the old days when I'm, you know, George Anstis, the groundsman, uh, and he, I was jogging around Stamford Bridge, I'd be jogging around Stamford Bridge, and he used to shout to me, "Stop limping, stop limping, you!" I used to tell Ozzy the same, you know, when Ozzy broke his leg. Uh, you know, remembering these characters, you know, and the things that happened in and around the club. I remember Batesy phoning me up one day when I was youth coach and saying, what are you doing? I happened to pick the phone up down in, in the in the bottom dressing room. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm on my lunch. He says, get your ass up here. So I drive up, the get my car, drive up to his uh, office on the left-hand side, 
And he walks out with Sir Dicky Attenborough. <laughs> he says, right, take us to Bibendum at the bottom of town. <laughs> and I got I got them in the back of my car talking and talking, Dicky Attenborough talking to me. I'm like, well, wow, what's this all about? You know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, listen, I, I got great memories. And of course, you know, the, the, the great disappointment, but, you know, obviously, I've I've got great memories of the club, and and I'm just just so lucky that uh, you know I've I've played for the club, and I still think that way. I do want to move on to a little bit on a current events, and one in particular that I ask all, all, all my guests, and some of them sort of get annoyed when I mention it, or others sort of do try and defend it. Is VAR now Eddie obviously being you know goalkeeping coach and sort of looking closely at the goalkeepers and having them with issues with VAR. What's your view of VAR? Are you for it? Or do you think that it needs to be tweaked? Or do you feel it needs to be completely erased? Well, first of all, people in general don't like change. Um, I think that it could be improved. I think that, that what I don't like about it is sometimes how long it takes for the decision to be made. And I also think that we can take a leaf out of the rugby world where is it a try, isn't it a try, can be translated. So to know what the officials are saying and talking about and can we really make that on a loudspeaker at the game so fans actually know what's going on. I think what frustrates us is the amount of time it takes. Is it a goal? Isn't it a goal? You take the excitement and the joy after and the elation after scoring away you know, and now you've got to wait and then you have this little celebration after if you scored or then you've got the great disappointment if you haven't. I know, I know it, it creates a drama, but it creates confusion. Mm. And I think, you know, I used to say this in goalkeeper and I still do. When the ball's coming across my box and I don't say anything, then silence creates confusion because if I'm coming for a cross and I say nothing, my own defender could hit me. That's right. You know, so information communication is so important, and I think that they can improve it greatly. And if they don't improve it, then get rid of it. Now, moving on to today's. What Chelsea, do you think? But what do you think, by the way? What do I think of it? I, I'm, I'm with you. I think that it's, it, it can be good for the game, although it's basically another referee's opinion on a match over the actual referee that's there at the stadium. Goal line technology, I think it's it it's exactly what is needed. But as you say, you're at the ground and you're waiting five to ten minutes for a decision, similar to what happened, um, you know, sort of going back about the Thiago Silva handball against Palace. Yeah. That took a while for the decision to be made. No one at the ground knew what was going on. All of a sudden, you'd see the referee go, right, it's a free kick rather than ascending off and yeah. it does create annoyance it's frustration for the fans I can't imagine what it's like for players really can't imagine I'm assuming it must be hell for them but yeah hopefully sooner than later it gets rectified to the point where as you say it's like rugby you know what the decision is it doesn't take too long and you can just enjoy the game more yeah I totally agree. Totally agree. And by the way, don't go there with handball decisions. Because, you know, when, when a penalty is given and somebody kicks a ball at somebody's hand from two yards away, and they say the hand is in an unnatural position. Mm -hmm. Well, don't go there. It's just well, ridiculous. I, well, I'm still spitting feathers of apparently it's OK to pull hair in the box and it's not a free kick. But nah, apart scandalous. from that... Scandalous. Apart from that, Chelsea of today, it's obviously changed... Again, we're obviously with managers, Graham Potter now is in charge. Chelsea have made some changes personnel-wise with incomings. And it seems that the club is going through a huge transitional period. What's your take on the modern-day Chelsea, Eddie? You know, do you think that it's building towards something special or do you feel that it's potentially getting more stagnated and it's going nowhere? Um, well, first of all, incredible things shouldn't surprise you in football, but looking from the outside in, unbelievably surprised when Thomas Tuchel lost his job. I was shocked. 
because of what he'd achieved at the club in such a short space of time. Um, but on the other hand, looking back, I remember when, obviously, I was part of the staff that went to Manchester City and then, obviously, the new owners came in there yeah. and we lost our jobs further down the line and, and the understanding of new people wanting maybe a freshness or their own people in, if you know what I mean. So from that side of it, I can understand. Um, but, you know, he, he did an incredible job at Chelsea. And I think that sometimes, you know, we change things too much. On the other side of it, Graham Potter's a good guy. I don't know him personally. I've heard very, very good things about him. Uh, his manner, the way he is with players, the way he is on the training ground. And it's also great to see a British coach get a job at a high-profile club. Yeah. I think for too long, too long, you know, we've had too many people from abroad coming in. And we've got a lot of good coaches in this country. And I think it's about time we stood up and started shouting for them. And I only hope that Graham Potter is very, very successful uh, because it helps all the other British coaches. So for me, that's important. Um, I think the people are exciting who've come in. I think obviously they've got new ideas. I think at times they, they might be better off keeping quiet. You know, i.e. this game, North v South, where are you going to fit it in, for instance, for God's sake? The players play enough football as it is. Um, I can see where they're coming from because, you know, the Americans have a lot of great ideas, but sometimes, mm. come on, mm. come on. So let's get our own house in order. I'm sure they're great guys. I'm sure they got the club at heart. They certainly seem to have the wealth that you need today to be competing at the top of the game. Um, I think now it's just the recruitment. And as long as Graham and his staff are allowed to get on with the job, I'm sure they'll do a very, very good job for Chelsea Football Club. Uh, the country needs a good Chelsea. The country, the country needs a great Chelsea uh -huh. to, to to compete against, you know, the other big guns around. And, uh, yeah. And there's a lot of special work going on as well further down, you know, with Neil Bath and, and Jim Fraser with the younger boys. You know, and Anthony Barry's doing a great job. I can see last night when they scored a goal, and I know he's very highly involved. He's highly rated and he's highly involved in uh, set play work, for instance. And, you know, you get Thiago Silva gets three headers in, you know, in the space of three corners, and Chelsea scored a goal. And so they're doing some great work there. And, I, you know, but it takes, you know, when you go have a new coach, give him a little bit of time. Hmm. But, you know, he's had a great start. It's a great start, and uh, I'm sure it'll do very, very well. And by the way, I had the pleasure. I had the pleasure of coming towards the end of last season, where friends of mine obviously still have season tickets to Chelsea, and uh, watching Thiago Silva live. Oh, yeah! Wow, enjoy the him. Voice of a defender. Enjoy him, enjoy <laughs> him, because there is a guy. The art of defending and the reading of the game, incredible. Yeah, top. Top. Keep him fit. Concur with that. Eddie, one final question, and it's been a fabulous interview, so thank you very much for your time tonight. How do you look back on your extraordinary Chelsea career? Uh, one of great fondness. Worked with so many wonderful people on the pitch and off the pitch. Um, makes me sad when I hear people criticise the club from days gone by. Um, because the club has always had the interest of the players at heart and the interest of the supporters at heart too. You know, to be so fondly remembered by so many Blues fans is is great feeling. I only wish I'd have played longer. Uh, it's the biggest regret of my life. But uh, yeah, it's uh, just listen to work with so many great players and great people. I've been lucky and... Uh, I only hope I can go on a little bit further and work with so many top people. You never know. <laughs> you never know, but I'm, sh I'm sure you will. Eddie, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I've appreciated it. I'm sure our listeners will appreciate listening to your incredible stories from Chelsea from different decades. So yeah. thank you once again, and hopefully we'll, I'm sure we'll see you down at the bridge uh, quite, quite soon cheering on the mighty Chelsea. Absolutely, absolutely. Up the chills.